I surrender. Then Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord and went to the high priest and asked for letters to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any there who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Is it hard for you to kick against the goads? So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was there for three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. The next couple of verses talk about a man named Ananias, a believer in Damascus. Jesus spoke to him in a vision and told him to go to the house where Saul was waiting and to pray for him to receive his sight and to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ananias wasn't too thrilled with that assignment. He knew who Saul was. He knew why Saul had come to the city, but he relented and he obeyed. Let's read in verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered the house. Laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me so that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. Then when he had taken food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Isn't this the man who destroyed those who called on the name of the Lord in Jerusalem? Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, I pray that you would come with a powerful visitation of your presence this morning. God, I pray that you would breathe life by the Holy Spirit from your holy scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I wonder if you've ever heard about the strange case of Lieutenant Hiro Onoda. 30 years after the end of World War II, he finally laid down his arms. Lieutenant Onoda was 23 years old when the Japanese army sent him to the Philippine island of Lubang in 1944. He was in charge of a surveillance unit of four men their orders were to observe the enemy's activity on the island and to gather intelligence in preparation of a Japanese invasion. The commanding officer told Lieutenant Onada, you are absolutely forbidden to die by your own hand. It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we will come back for you. Until then, so long as you have just one soldier, you are to lead him. You may have to live on coconuts. If that's the case, live on coconuts. Under no circumstances are you to surrender. In October of 1945, Lieutenant Onada found the first leaflet printed in Japanese announcing that the war was over. But he decided that it must be an ally trick. So he retreated deeper into the jungle with his men. In December of 1945, a B-52 bomber flew over the island, dropping leaflets into the jungle, printed in Japanese with an order to surrender from the Japanese General Yamashita. Again, Lieutenant Onada decided it must be a trick. 
He and his men moved around the jungle, hiding in caves, eating bananas and coconuts. Occasionally, they would raid a farm and steal some food, steal some animals. They were suspicious of all the villagers that they were ally spies, so they stayed hidden from them. Patrols went out into the jungle looking for Lieutenant Onada and his men. They shouted through bullhorns in Japanese. They left copies of Japanese newspapers with messages written on them. The war is over. Please come down out of the mountains. One of his men began to suspect that maybe the war really was over. And he finally escaped from Lieutenant Onada and it took him six months to come out of the jungle. When the families of the other three men learned that they were still alive. <laughs> Are we back on? There we go. We're back on. They, they sent photographs and handwritten letters begging Lieutenant Onada and his men to surrender. But they believed it was all a trick of the enemy. In 1954, 10 years after the war was over, one of Lieutenant Onada's men got a wound in his leg and he died from it. For the next 20 years, Lieutenant Onada and one man traipsed through the jungles. From time to time, they had run-ins with villagers and with Filipino police. They killed 30 people and wounded 100 others. In 1972, the last man serving under Lieutenant Onada's command died from a gunshot wound from a Filipino patrol. In 1974, a Japanese college dropout decided that he was going to see the world. He told his friends, I'm going to find Lieutenant Onada, a, a panda bear, and the abominable snowman, in that order. So he flew to the island of Lubang, and it only took him four days to find Lieutenant Onada. He explained to him that the war was over, but Lieutenant Onada refused to believe him unless his commanding officer came himself and told him to surrender. The Japanese college student went back to Japan and actually found his commanding officer, who was now the owner of a bookstore. <laughs> they flew back to Japan. And on March 9th, 1974, Lieutenant Hiro Onada finally laid down his arms 30 years after the war was over. That's his picture. That's his commanding officer. You see the big smile on his face? He's thinking, yeah, this guy's a real idiot. <laughs> That's the college student who found him on the other side. In his book, My 30-Year War, Onada writes, I said to him, Really? The war is over? How could they have been so sloppy? He said, suddenly everything went black. A storm raged inside of me. I felt like a fool. What had I been doing all these years? Gradually, the storm subsided, and for the first time, I really understood that my 30 years as a guerrilla fighter for the Japanese army were over. I pulled back the bolt on my rifle and unloaded the bullets. I took the pack that I always carried with me and I laid it down with the gun on top of it. Would I really have no more use for this rifle that I had polished and cared for like a baby all of these years? Had the war really ended 30 years ago? What had Shimada and Kazuka died for and what, I had, what had I fought for all alone? Saul was waging a personal war of his own. Just like Stephen, Saul had come to the conclusion that the followers of Jesus were incompatible with the Jewish establishment. He regarded the Jesus movement as dangerous, as blasphemous, and a serious threat to the purity and the unity of the Jewish people. Just like Stephen, Saul concluded things cannot keep going on this way. So he determined himself that he was going to stomp out the church once and for all. It wasn't enough for him that large numbers of Christians had already been pushed out of Jerusalem. Saul began to hunt them down in other cities. On the road to Damascus at midday, Saul and his party were knocked to the ground by a blinding flash of light. 
Jesus appeared and right there on the Damascus Road occurred one of the greatest surrenders in human history. The fiercest ever persecutor of Jesus Christ became the finest ever propagator of Jesus Christ. And as we look at the story of Saul's conversion, I find three conditions of surrender for every follower of Jesus. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Three conditions of surrender for every follower of Jesus. The first one is this. Surrender to Jesus as Lord. Surrender to Jesus as Lord. Beloved, listen to me and may God give you grace. Saul's experience on the Damascus Road reminds us of some vital truths that we need to hear today more than ever. One truth is this. Christian conversion is not your decision. It is an unconditional surrender to Jesus. Christian conversion isn't your decision. It's an unconditional surrender to him. You know, many times we talk about conversion. I, I even do this when I give altar calls. We talk about conversions in terms that imply that we're in complete control of the transaction. We talk about accepting Jesus. We talk about receiving Jesus into our hearts, inviting him in as if we're a consumer selecting a product off the shelf or, or a service. But Saul's encounter on the Damascus Road reminds us that God is the one who's in control of each and every salvation transaction. Beloved, listen to me, because this is good preaching right here. It is not we who invite Jesus into our hearts. It is he who invites us into his kingdom. We don't choose him. He chooses us. We don't summon him when we're ready for him. He summons us when he's ready. You know, I love that old spiritual, I have decided to follow Jesus. But, you know, maybe it needs a rewrite. He has decided to become my leader. Glory be to his name. Saul reminds us that God is the initiator of our salvation. God took the initiative and he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross. And God takes the initiative for salvation in every one of our hearts. Jesus said, no one comes to me unless my father draws him. He told the disciples, you didn't pick me, I picked you. He called his followers the ones whom my father has given me. Paul said, don't you realize... It's the kindness of God that has brought you to repentance. Hebrews calls Jesus the author of eternal salvation for each one who obeys him. You know, growing up in the church, I had Christian friends who thought of salvation as a decision that was theirs to make. I'll accept Jesus when I'm ready. After I've had time to sow my wild oats... After I've had time to have young, to have fun and be young and drink Pepsi, then I'll get serious with Jesus. As if God has given any one of us that prerogative to accept him when and where and under what circumstances we choose. Beloved, true Christian conversion is not that way. True Christian conversion is my unconditional surrender to Jesus when and where and how he chooses. Isaiah said, call on the Lord while he may be found, while he's near. Another truth that Saul reminds us of is that true Christian conversion is not the adoption of doctrine. It's a personal encounter with the Son of God. Right. Beloved, listen to me. The only way you may truly become a Christian is to personally meet Jesus. You cannot be born into Christianity. You cannot marry into Christianity. You cannot pass some exam and be admitted to the bar. 
Christian life begins when I have a real life encounter with his presence. Do you know so many people today are just like Saul. They know that Jesus was, but they don't know who Jesus is. There was no doubt in Saul's mind that a man named Jesus of Nazareth had lived and died. Saul was a young student of Gamaliel when they crucified Jesus on Calvary. Saul knew that Jesus was, but he didn't know who Jesus is until he met him. Saul's two questions on the Damascus road must become our question. Who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? There were two things that Saul learned about Jesus that day. First of all, Saul learned that Jesus is alive. Jesus said, I am the living one. I was dead, but see, now I live forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and hell. Jesus' resurrection is God's vindication and validation of his life. In one instant, when Saul realized that Jesus is alive, he realized that Jesus is everything he said. Not only did Saul realize that Jesus is alive, Saul realized that Jesus is large and in charge. His face shines with a light that is brighter than the noonday sun. His voice is like the sound of many rushing waters. His presence knocks defiant men right off their feet and leaves them trembling in despair of their very lives. When the temple guard came into the garden and said, we are seeking Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. The revelation of his presence knocked them right off their feet onto their little tushies. Beloved, listen to me. Jesus knows your name. He knows your mother tongue. He knows your exact coordinates on the road of life. Jesus knows where you've been. He knows where you're headed. He knows whom you're traveling with. He knows the most intimate thoughts and intents of your heart. One flash of light from his glorious face is all it takes to knock you off your feet and to rearrange your whole life. Who are you, Lord? And what must I do? True Christian conversion begins with an overwhelming encounter with the Son of God. His presence arrests us. It could happen anywhere, at any time. It could happen when you're all alone. It did for me when I was just a little boy in my bedroom one night. It could happen during worship. It could happen during a sermon. It could happen at an altar. It could happen when you're on your way to do something really bad. We might never have the experience that Paul had of seeing a bright light from heaven. But Paul later wrote to the Corinthians that the really important thing about that moment was that God's light shone in his heart. He said, God, who said, let the light shine in the darkness, made his light shine in my heart. And he gave me the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Somewhere, sometime, somehow, Jesus' presence arrests us and we become convinced that he is alive and that he is Lord. Beloved, listen to me. Jesus is not the pale, defeated figure hanging on the cross that some people imagine him to be. He is not the mild-mannered, stoic philosopher of modern-day Protestantism. He is not the benevolent genie in a bottle handing out divine favors when we need them. He is the living one. He is the one who was dead and now lives forever, and he holds the keys. True Christian conversion begins with a moment when Jesus rocks your world. And you say like Saul to Jesus, I surrender. Three conditions of surrender for every follower of Jesus. Surrender to Jesus as Lord. Secondly, surrender your old way of life. 
Surrender your old way of life. Beloved, listen to me. May God give you grace. There is a truth that Saul's conversion communicates that we desperately need to hear again in America. True Christian conversion means a radical reordering of your life. Seems like so many people today approach Christianity with the idea that they can just add Jesus to their lives. You know, they intend to keep on living the same way they always have. They intend to keep on doing the same things they've always done, but now I have JC in my corner. JC is my boy. JC's got my back. I'm not going to do anything different, but JC, he's watching over me. Early missionaries to India were delighted when they found that people were eager to receive Jesus as their God. The Hindus worshipped millions, literally, of gods and goddesses. They were very happy to add one more to the list. But the enthusiasm dwindled in a hurry when the missionaries explained to them that receiving Jesus as Lord means that they must let go of all their other gods. Now that was another matter altogether. But so many times our notion of Christianity is no different. We just try to add Jesus to life as we know it, like we're adding a friend on Facebook. But beloved, listen, that is not at all authentic Christianity. True Christianity isn't just one facet of your life. True Christianity is a whole new way of life. There are five different designations for followers of Jesus in Acts 9. One of them is people of the way, the way of Jesus, the way of salvation. Christianity is a radically different way of life. True Christian conversion is the realization that your old way of life was insulting to God. Saul was in the shock of, in for the shock of his life. Jesus knocked him off of his high horse and he said, Saul, why are you hurting me? Saul thought that he was defending God. He had no idea all the while that he was offending God. Then Jesus said to Saul, aren't you tired of kicking against the goads? Goads are our cattle prods. They're used to, to guide cattle. Saul didn't realize it, but he had spent his entire life resisting the Holy Spirit. He had spent his entire life bucking against God's leadership. Later on, Paul talks about his life before Christ. He says, I thought I was a good person. I was so sincere about doing what was right. I was so sincere about doing my very best. I tried my hardest. I did. I thought I was good. So many people today are just like Saul. They're unaware that their whole way of life is offensive to God and defiant of his leadership. While they're pursuing their own goals, while they're chasing their own dreams, while they're seeking out their own happiness and pleasure and fulfillment, they're unaware that they're ignoring God and even sinning against Him. Just like Saul, so many people don't see their fallen nature clearly. Saul thought he was a good person, but Acts 9 verse 1 says that he had killer breath. It says that he breathed out murderous threats, death wishes. How many people do you know, people you work with, people in your neighborhood, in your family, who, who they think that they're really, they genuinely think I'm a good person, but they really have killer breath. Their mouths are full of negativity and criticism and anger and malice towards others and even death wishes. Jesus said, out of the contents of the heart, the mouth speaks. Just like Saul, so many people think that they're making valuable contributions to society. They think they're making valuable contributions to the world. They don't realize that they're actually hurting people by thwarting God's work on earth. Just like Lieutenant Onada 
Saul had to face a horrible moment on the Damascus road when he realized that for all those years he had been so wrong. Beloved, Christian conversion means the same thing for us. It's an awful moment when we realize how wrong we've been. The great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon tells of a prince that boarded a ferry one day. Beneath the deck was a rowing gallery where prisoners were pulling at the oars, serving out their sentences. The prince went down below deck and he began to ask the prisoners one by one, what are you here for? What was your crime? Each man declared his innocence to the prince. One said, I was framed. Another said, false witnesses were paid to testify against me. Another said, the judge was bribed. Finally, the prince came and he stood over one man and he said, and what about you, sir? Without looking up, the prisoner said to him, I am serving out my just reward for my many sins. Immediately, the prince called the captain. Quick, he said, remove this man at once from the presence of these honest and upstanding citizens. It's not right that they should be made to bear his presence any longer. And the prince escorted the penitent prisoner off of the ferry that afternoon, a free man. Oh, we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. True Christian conversion is surrendering your old identity for a new one. When the light from heaven disappeared, Saul's traveling companions helped him back up onto his feet. He was blinded, and they led him by the hand to Damascus. He spent three days in the dark praying and fasting. One purpose of fasting is for repentance and for purification. Another purpose is to seek direction from heaven. And all of those things were accomplished for Saul. During those three days in the dark, Saul identified with the death and the burial of Jesus who laid in a tomb for three days. And during that time, Saul's entire identity was stripped away from him and he emerged from the dark a new man. He wrote about it later. He said, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives in me. For me to live is Christ. But whatever things were valuable to me, I now count as loss the things I liked about myself, the things I took pride in, the things that made me feel significant, I now count as rubbish that I might gain Christ. The proud son of the tribe of Benjamin, named after Israel's first king, even changed his name from Saul to Paul, which means little. Beloved, Christian conversion is no less for us. It involves a stripping process. The things that we once took pride in, the things that once made us feel significant and valuable and important, we surrender to the feet of Jesus. True Christian conversion is surrendering your old goals for a new one. You know, Saul had an uncommon ability to focus on his goals. If he had lived in the 20th century, he most certainly would have been an Edison or a Bill Gates or a Steve Jobs. If he had been a politician, he surely would have been president. If he had been a businessman, he would have been Warren Buffett. If he had been an athlete, he would have had a championship ring. Remember, we talked last week about Philip pursuing the Ethiopian in the noonday sun. Nothing in Palestine moved in midday, but here was that old fool, Saul, that was so determined to reach his goal in Damascus, he was out on the road in the noonday sun. 
But when he emerged from three days in the dark, his old goals were forgotten completely and he was focused on just one new goal and that was to become like Jesus. Another word for followers of Jesus in Acts 9 is the word disciples. A disciple was a student of a rabbi. But unlike today, the goal wasn't to get information from your teacher. The goal was to become like your teacher, to imitate your teacher. After the encounter on the Damascus Road, Saul had just one goal in life, and that was to become a disciple, to become an imitator, to become like Jesus. He wrote later on, I consider everything lost compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord. Oh, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his suffering, being made like him in his death so that I might attain to the resurrection. Saul would have made a very good New Yorker. We tend to have an uncommon amount of drive towards our goals. But as you think about your own life, what is the goal that you're pursuing? What goal are you driving for in the midday heat? Is it to make buckets of money? Is it to give your family the best of everything? Can I tell you on the face of it, it seems like a noble goal. At the root of it is a sin of pride. Is it to raise your kids to be picture-perfect, well-rounded, sophisticated citizens of this world? Is it to find true love? Is it to have the most fun? Is it to be famous? What is the goal that you're focused on? Or is it the goal of Christ-likeness? Are you focused on the goal of knowing Him as much as any man has ever known Him? Are you focused on the goal of being like him as much as any man has ever been like him. Jesus said, seek first Christ's leadership and his likeness, and God will add everything else to your life. Christian conversion is surrendering your old speech and your old behavior for a new talk and a new walk. Christian conversion is surrendering your old relationships and associations for new ones. Everybody in Saul's party saw the light, but only Saul saw Jesus Christ. Everybody traveling with him heard a sound, but only Saul discerned the voice of Jesus. When it was over, his traveling companions stood there speechless. They didn't know what had just happened, and they didn't know what to do with Saul. Beloved, can I tell you, when Jesus comes along and he rocks your world, some of the people that you've been traveling with will not understand what just happened to you and they won't know what to do with you. They won't like the new you. They'll want the old you back again. Saul's boys turned on him. His new family in Christ had to stuff him in a basket and had to lower him down the wall of the city of Damascus because his boys were trying to kill him. The believers in Jerusalem had to whisk him away to the seacoast and put him on a ship for Tarsus because his boys had turned on him. Beloved, when you surrender to Jesus... It will cause ties to be severed with your old traveling companions. The people who felt like family to you yesterday will be strangers to you today. And the people that were complete strangers to you yesterday and completely strange to you yesterday will become your new family in Jesus Christ. Another term for followers of Jesus in Acts 9 is brothers. When Ananias met Saul, his first words to the complete stranger who had persecuted the church was, Brother Saul. Beloved, listen to me. May God give you grace. We need, we need God to help us. We need to hear this word. We need to receive it in our spirit. True Christian conversion is the radical reordering of your old life. We used to sing an old spiritual. There's been a great change since I've been born. 
The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. The things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. The people I used to know, I don't know them anymore. There's been a great change since I've been born again. Surrender your old way of life to Jesus. Say like Saul to Jesus, I surrender. Three conditions of surrender for every follower of Jesus. You doing all right? You need a little, we need a little cold air in the sanctuary. Can I get you anything? A little hot chocolate, something to refresh you. I'm flying to Phoenix this afternoon. See ya. I'm going to where it's warm. I'm leaving you in the snow for a week. But let me tell you this before I go. Three conditions of surrender for every follower of Jesus. Surrender to Jesus as Lord. Surrender your old way of life. And finally this, surrender to Jesus' call. Surrender to Jesus' call. One more vital truth. Please don't miss it. May God give you grace. True Christian conversion always comes with a call to service. On the Damascus Road, Saul asked Jesus, Who are you, Lord, and what must I do? Jesus told him, Get up, go into the city, and I will show you what you must do. Beloved, Jesus' call to salvation is always accompanied by a call to service. Jesus said, You didn't pick me I picked you and I ordained you to go and bear fruit, fruit that remains. Yeah. Years after the Damascus Road experience, Paul wrote, By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance that we should do. When you got saved, you got called at the same instant. And our call to service means that we must surrender to God's preparation process in our life. Subsequent to the Damascus Road, the verses in Acts chapter 9 cover a three-year period in Saul's life. During that time, his preparation included time alone in the wilderness with God. His preparation included time studying the word and fasting and praying. Saul's preparation included receiving care from the body of Christ and participating in the body of Christ. His preparation process included suffering rejection and setbacks. Saul's early ministry in Damascus and in Jerusalem was a disaster. No one received his word. It was nothing of the raving success that he experienced later in his missionary journeys. The church in Jerusalem, it says in Acts 9, they didn't enjoy peace and they didn't enjoy another wave of growth until after they put Saul on a boat and sent him out of the country. How many of you know it is pretty bad when the church has to put you on a boat and send you away so that revival can come back again? Saul's preparation included waiting and waiting and waiting, about 10 years went by sowing tents in Tarsus before Barnabas came one day and fetched him and took him to Antioch where he went into the ministry. Beloved, listen to me. When you were saved, you received a call. But that call comes with a surrendering to God's preparation process in your life. Some of you here today, the Holy Spirit wants to speak a word of encouragement. You're wondering, God, why am I going through the things that I'm going through? Why am I struggling with the things that I'm struggling with? God, why am I facing setbacks and hardships and difficulties? Why am I waiting? You made a promise. God, why hasn't it come? Can I tell you? It's because God has a call on your life and it's all part of his preparation. But beloved, listen to me. Your call to service comes with a promise that Jesus will make something beautiful out of your life. 
Paul wrote to the Ephesians, I pray, I pray that the eyes of your heart would be opened so that you would understand what is the hope of his calling. We have a little saying around here at harvest time. Your call is not your call. Your call is his call. It's not your call. Whether you're called, you are called. It's his call. It's not your call to what you've been called. It's his call on you. But beloved, can I tell you, there is a hope. There's a promise of hope that comes with that call. Everything that you need, all the provision that you need, all the protection that you need, all the preservation that you need, all the courage that you need, all the wisdom that you need, all the creativity that you need, all the strength that you need, all the longevity that you need, it is all in his call. The call shapes you and and molds you. The call identifies you. It defines you. Paul wrote later on, it's by the grace of God's call on my life that I have become what I am today. It is all in the call. This is a picture of a man named Sadhu Sundar Singh. In India, he is known as the apostle of bleeding feet. At the dawn of the 20th century, he preached the gospel across northern India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Burma, Tibet, Malaysia, and China. He was born into a Sikh family. His parents sent him to a Christian missionary school to learn English. But at the age of 14, when his mother passed away, Sundar Singh blamed the Christian God. He went on a vendetta against Christians. He incited in his hometown, he incited persecution against the Christian missionaries and against Christian converts. He invited his friends to the public square where he took a Bible and he burned the entire Bible one page at a time in defiance of the Christian God. He was so distraught over the loss of his mother that he finally decided that he was going to kill himself by throwing himself in front of a train that passed by his house every morning. But the night before, he had a vision of Jesus Christ. Vision, Jesus uh, appeared to him and said, Sundar, why are you resisting me? Is it hard for you to kick against the goats? He surrendered his life to Jesus. And when the sun came up, he went to his father and he told his father, I have become a follower of Jesus Christ now. His father disowned him, threw him out of the house, disinherited him. On his 16th birthday, he was baptized in water as a Christian believer And his family invited him to the family home for what he thought was a birthday celebration. He thought, this is great. God has answered my prayers. I'm reconciling with my family. But they poisoned him. They left him out in the street to die. Somebody found him and took him to the doorstep of a Christian missionary. And as he lay there dying on a bed, he said this thought came to him. He said, God, surely... You didn't save me out of this darkness in order to let me go into eternity without even telling one single person about Jesus. On the basis of that one single thought, God, it cannot be, it cannot be that you rescued me. It cannot be that you saved me only to let me die before I can tell just one about Jesus on the basis of that thought alone. With the last bit of strength left in his body, he began to contend in prayer for his life. God healed him and he recovered completely from the poison. He dressed up in the orange robe of a sadhu, an Indian holy man. And without shoes on his feet, he began walking across India telling people about Jesus. He was arrested, 
Numerous times he was interrogated, he was beaten, he was stoned and left for dead on several occasions. The last time that he was seen, he was 39 years old and he was crossing again over the mountains into Tibet to tell them one more time about Jesus. No one knows for sure what became of him. It's said that he was martyred and that his body was thrown into a river he was never found. But he was credited in his lifetime with doing hundreds and hundreds of spectacular miracles in the name of Jesus and leading tens of thousands of people to faith in Christ and laying the foundation for the 20th century church in India, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Burma, in Tibet, in Malaysia, and in China. All because... On the day that he became a Christian, he grabbed hold of the hope of his calling. Beloved, I want to tell you, I feel a word of encouragement from the Holy Spirit. Pastor Jason, come help me. If you're not sure that you're going to make it, if you're not sure that you're going to be able to hold it together, if you're not sure you're going to be able to hold your marriage together, if you're not sure you're going to be able to hold your family together, if you're not sure you're going to make ends meet, if you're not sure you're going to live, grab hold of the hope of his calling this morning. Everybody look at me and may God give you grace. If you're saved, you are called. And if you are called, you will surely be saved. The same hope that sustained Saul in the Arabian desert. The same hope that sustained him while he was being lowered in a basket down the city wall of Damascus. The same hope that sustained him when his preaching was rejected in Jerusalem. The same hope that sustained him while he was sowing tents for 10 years in Tarsus will sustain you too. If you will only say like Saul to Jesus, I surrender. Three conditions of surrender for every follower of Jesus. Surrender to Jesus as Lord. Surrender your old way of life. And surrender to His call. Would you stand on your feet right now? And would you give Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, a great big praise in this place. Oh, come on, I know you can do better. Come on, I know you can do better than that. Come on, give him a great big praise. Come on, let's give him a great big praise in this place. Come on, would you say the name of Jesus with me? Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we magnify you. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we praise you. Come on, I want you to lift your face to heaven. Lift your hands, and we have to do it. We have to sing it. All to Jesus, I surrender. Come on, make it your prayer. Thank you, Jesus. All to Jesus, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Come on, would you lift up your hands right now? Lift up your face to Jesus. And would you just do that right now? Come on, would you surrender right now? Come on, just tell him I surrender all. I surrender all, I surrender all, I surrender all to you, Jesus. Shh. Come on, come on, lift up your heart. I surrender all, Jesus. Come on, I surrender all, Jesus. Come on, church, would you lift up your hands and just love on Jesus for just one moment in this place. Come on, this is a holy moment. His presence is here. Come on, just love on him, love on him, love on him. Come on, Come 
come on, Jesus wants to come right now and give a powerful encounter. Jesus wants to make a light shine from heaven directly into your heart to give you the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Come on, lift up your hands, lift up your hearts, lift up your faces. Tell them again, I surrender, Jesus. I surrender. Would you bow your heads all over this place with me? We're going to go in just one moment. Before we do, I have to ask this question. Lieutenant Hiro Onada fought a 30-year war unnecessarily. Saul, Saul, is it hard for you to kick against the goats? Is it hard for you to resist the leadership of the Holy Spirit? Is it hard for you to buck against Him? Come on, this is a holy moment. I wonder if there's someone here who's been waging your own personal war. And today's your day to surrender to God. Don't care whether you grew up in this church. Don't care how many times you heard the message. Don't care how many times in VBS or, or Sunday school you raised your hand. This is the day. This is a holy moment. Jesus is here. This is the day. This is the day to surrender to Him. It's not really your decision. It's not your call. It's just an unconditional surrender to Jesus had about 15 people in the last service who surrendered to Jesus. I wonder if there's someone here today who would say, today's my day to surrender to Him, to accept His invitation into His kingdom, to say yes to Jesus. While heads are bowed all over this place, if it's you, if this is your day to surrender, I want to lead you in a prayer. And I want you to lift your hand high in the air. Today's my day to surrender. Come on, there's one. There's two. Come on, there's three. Come on, today's my day to surrender. There's four. There's five. Come on, this is my day to surrender. Come on, today is my day to say yes to Him. It's not your decision. You don't get to decide. It's not when and how and under what circumstances you choose. It, it, call on the Lord while he may be found. There's another hand. Come on. Someone else lift it high. Today's my day to surrender. There's another one. Come on. Today's my day to surrender. There's another one. Come on. Today's my day to surrender to Jesus. There's another one. Lift your hand up high. Today's my day to surrender to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Come on, this is a holy moment. Listen, you're about to have an encounter with the Son of God. A light is about to shine inside of your heart. Your world is about to get rocked by the presence of Jesus. Come on, someone else. Quickly, quickly, someone else. Lift your hand high so I can see it. Somebody else. Thank you, Father. Come on, Holy Spirit is here. It's a good day. Oh, this is a good day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want everybody in this place. Would you all lift up your hands? Come on. I prayed that prayer when I was just a little kid in my room all by myself. But it feels so good every time I pray it again. It feels good every time I surrender again. Come on, I want you to all pray with me. I don't care whether it was last year. I don't care whether it was a decade ago that you made that moment of surrender. Let's do it again right now. I'm going to lead. I want everyone to follow after me. And let's surrender to Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving me. Father, thank you for sending your only son. Jesus, thank you for coming. You lived for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you rose from the dead. I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, I surrender. I lay down my arms. I'm not going to fight you anymore. I'm not going to resist you anymore. 
Jesus, I'm turning from my old way of life. Wash me. Wash away my sins. Set me free from addiction. Set me free from darkness. Heal me. Jesus, I surrender. I acknowledge you as my Lord and the leader of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come on, let's give the Lord a big praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Listen to me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, as soon as this service is over, our pastors will be right here. I want you to come. We want to celebrate with you. And we want to give you something that's going to help you get started on your new walk in Jesus. Sing it one more time. I surrender all. And I surrender all. And I surrender all. And all to Thee, my blessed Savior. I Come on, sing it again. Take it your prayer. I surrender all to Jesus. And I surrender. praise in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, last, last thing, and then we really are going to go because I have to catch a plane. Last thing, listen. Holy Spirit wants to encourage somebody here today to grab hold of the hope of His calling. You wonder, God, why am I going through what I'm going through? It's just part of his process. He's just preparing you. You know what it says in Acts chapter 9? Oh, I got so much preach left in me. You know what it says in Acts chapter 9? While Paul was in the desert in Arabia, while he was being rejected in Damascus and lowered down the city wall in a basket, while he was being rejected in Jerusalem, while he was sowing tents in Tarsus. You know what it says? It says he became more and more powerful. Listen, while you're going through all you're going through, you're becoming more and more powerful every day. With every setback, with every trial, with everything that you overcome, with every stitch of the needle, you are becoming more and more powerful in the calling of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. Barnabas is on the way. Barnabas is headed in your direction. He's coming knocking on your door. He says he's going to come pull you out of mothballs. He's going to come pull you out of retirement and say, come on, there's a ministry waiting in Antioch. The world is waiting for you. Listen to me. Every day you're becoming more and more powerful. And if you're discouraged, if you're confused, if you're worried, like maybe I've seen my best days and the things that I dreamed about in my heart, the promises, maybe they're just not going to happen. I want you to grab a hold of the hope of His calling this morning. I want you to just put your hand up, just lift it up, come on. And I want you to just grab hold of it. If you are saved, you are called. If you are called, you are surely saved. If you are saved, you are called. If you are called, you are surely saved. Grab hold, come on, just say, I grab hold. I grab hold today. I grab hold of the hope of His calling. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, now as we go our own way, God, I pray that the cloud of your protection would envelop us. I pray your presence would surround us.